In August of 1950, the Windsors were invited to the second wedding of Herman Rogers. Catherine had died in May of 1949. His new bride was a widow, Lucy Wan, who had been part of his social circle. What he had not realized was that Wallace, long in love with Herman herself, still had designs on him. There's no question that these women were rivals in love, remembered Lucy's daughter-in-law, Kitty Blair. Both wanted Herman. Wallace would have grabbed him and told the Duke to go. Wallace made her feelings clear, telling Lucy Wan, I hold you responsible if anything happens to Herman. He's the only man I've ever loved. How nice for the Duke, Lucy icily replied. Her boredom in her own marriage had been acute, and she was no longer as discreet as before when it came to hiding her feelings, according to one friend of the Windsors. Having failed to dissuade Herman from marrying Lucy, Wallace sought her revenge in other ways. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise, and today we are doing another chapter of Trader King. Now, if you are like one of those people who I've heard from recently who thought that I had just quit doing this book, no, of course not. I just have gotten really jacked up over the holidays, and our episode keeps coming out in the middle of the week instead of on Sunday, which is messed up. I know. It was our Sunday treat, and now I've ruined it for you. But I haven't stopped doing the book by any means, and there's still been a chapter out every single week. So this is our chapter this week, and by next Sunday, we'll be back on track. It is my New Year's resolution to do better about that. Now, chapter 18, The Wandering Windsors, was a 10 out of 10 pleasure read. There's been some fantastic chapters in this book. There's been some, oh, it's kind of boring. There's some, been some sort of bureaucratic chapters, which I mean, I gotta be honest with you. I don't like the politic part of it. I don't really like the war part of it. You know, because it's a lot of names and trying to keep up with things. I'm like, I don't know. I just want the gossip. This chapter was so exactly what I wanted when I picked up this book because it is slap full from start to finish story after story after story after story of them just being embarrassing and they don't even know it and that's the thing that's like so unbelievable when I'm reading this like there were times I was like literally cringing in my seat it was so embarrassing what they're doing and they don't even get it they don't know that everybody is laughing at them they don't have any concept of the fact that their behavior is outrageous they are so stingy, so miserly. The way they treat their staff, the way that they go about putting on parties, the way that the way that Wallace treats her rivals, I mean, it is astounding. So this is a get a snack and sit down and just relish kind of chapter. There's oh, as always. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Um, if you are subscribed but you haven't hit the bell for notifications, it might be one of the reasons why you weren't getting these chapters. Because if you'll hit that bell for notifications, you'll you'll get a, a little ding ding, you know, when I drop another episode. So hit the bell for notifications. That way you don't miss any of these episodes. And um, like, comment, and subscribe as always. It's so appreciated. All right, chapter eighteen: The Wandering Windsors. Sit down. It's a good one. So the Windsors spent the winter of 1947 with Arthur Vernay at his home in the Bahamas, the first time the couple had returned to the island since 1945. And you might be thinking, as I was, uh, why are you guys back at the Bahamas? I thought you hated that place. All you could do is complain about it. But now they want to scuttle on back and spend the winter? Does anything these people do make sense? Well, probably so that they could fall on the hospitality of Arthur Vernay. They had met this Vernay character during the war. He was an English-born American art and antiques dealer. He was a decorator, a big game hunter, an explorer. And it wasn't just that winter, but many winters thereafter that they spent with him in the Bahamas. Why would they do that? Well, it's a free place to stay. You know, God forbid they ever just get a home of their own and stop falling on the necks of all of their rich friends. Well, you know, when you can't spend time with Arthur Benet, where else can you go? After they went... After they were in the Bahamas, they moved to Palm Beach, where they had their friend Robert Young host them. Now, you'll recall Robert Young. His name pops up all the time, and it's such a sort of generic name, it's easy to forget who he is. He was that old guy who was an old railroad tycoon, so they're constantly falling on his friendship. And, you know, he, you just get the feeling that he's sort of like this, he's this person, I feel like, who was probably important one time, but isn't as important as he once was. And so he feels really rejuvenated to have the former king of an empire and his bony wife hanging out with him. It, it makes Robert Young feel well. So he's always including David in all these things that he does. But you get the feeling that Robert Young was kind of a nobody as far as the American elite circle went, like he'd been forgotten. Anyway, 
They move on to him in Palm Beach after they're done cavorting all over the Bahamas that winter of 1947. The book says that though they'd never totally been accepted in Newport or New York, the Windsors loved Palm Beach, where the Duke regularly played golf and where they were treated as royalty, with bows and curtsies, positions at the head of table, and they were served first. Protocol required that no one could leave until they did, which often led to tensions, as the Duke enjoyed lingering. Sometimes at parties, for no apparent reason, the Duke would insist on speaking only in German, one biographer remembered. Okay, you guys, so this is the beginning of just bam, 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 bam. Weird story after weird story after weird story. Crazy sketch after crazy sketch of their personalities. David would go to parties and just speak in German. And it was all the more obnoxious because people couldn't leave until he did. So he's wandering around taking forever to leave, speaking in language nobody knew. I also find it very odd that he would choose to speak in German right after the war. Now, maybe it's, you know, is it xenophobic for people to have been freaked out by anything German after the war? Yeah, but it's a reality. That's how people felt. They were very anti-German at the time. So for him to walk around speaking German, it's almost like he is baiting people. Um, he was, for all intents and purposes, he was German himself. I mean, his lineage was German. He'd spoken German. He'd spent many, 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 many a summer in Germany. I don't know what he was trying to do there. Was he just trying to sort of poke the beast? Was he trying to be very cavalier about a subject he knew many people were touchy about? Who even knows? But anyway, obnoxiousness. Uh, the book says that since German was a language with which most of the Palm Beach winter colony was not familiar, there was often evenings when for long periods no one had the slightest idea what the Duke was talking about. During the day, the male members of the Everglades Club would draw straws to see who would play golf with the Duke. The loser got him as a golfing partner. He was, it seemed, a painfully slow player, planning and discussing his shots for what felt like hours. Can you imagine being such a colossal bore that people would draw straws to see who had to play with you? The book says that King Leopold of Belgium, a regular golfing partner, remembered how the Duke was, quote, always eager to win and tended to forget his score. Once I saw David take three shots in a trap and then give himself a five. Oh my goodness. It's that kind of behavior that is so annoying. And... But what is so surprising to me is how childish it is. I mean, I will tell you the hours that I spend out on the playground with fourth graders, you know, listening to their petty grievances about how so-and-so was tagged during freeze tag, but he wouldn't stop and it's so unfair and, and the tears and the, and the wailing and the why can't he learn to play fairly? I mean, you expect it in the fourth grade playground. I just do not expect that grown men should be over here wanting to take this three shots in a trap when everyone sees you do it and then be like, I'll take five on that. Uh, like he just makes himself such an abomination. In May 1947, the Windsors returned to London from the United States. Asked about a new job, the Duke replied, I might do something sometime, but I've nothing definite in mind. I never take life easy. I never have and I never shall. You never take life easy. What, pray, have you been doing thus far? that has been so arduous and such a task for you to have to complete. The Duke took the opportunity to lobby Clement Attlee for a job, and he also wanted to see his mother on her 80th birthday. There was a lunch, but he had not been invited to it. Now, while they were there, uh, Gwyneth Gladwin, who saw the couple at a tea given by Sybil Colfax, leaves a portrait of the former king, and I found this to be so accurate it was shocking. She said, at first glance, he appears extraordinarily youthful. A boyish figure and small nose give him a very juvenile look. But, and this is what I've noticed before in pictures myself. She says, but as one examines him more carefully, one is almost unpleasantly shocked to see how old, wrinkled, and worried his face is and how pathetic his expression. His hair is golden and I fancy must be dyed for he must be over 50. He was amiable and alert, but one was terribly aware of his instability. He talked a great deal, not interestingly, but keenly. In fact, he hardly drew breath. We discussed conferences, the Russians, servant difficulties, the French, places he'd been to, and so on. I envy his remarkable memory. He appeared to remember dates and names with ease and accuracy. He spoke with a profound American accent and used American expressions, which rather jarred me. He kept looking at his watch and wondering why the Duchess didn't arrive and finally dashed into the next room to telephone to find out what had detained her. Why? I just, the, the continual question for me in this entire book is why did the Duke think that Wallace Simpson was such a catch? 
I, I wish the book would reveal to us what was going on behind closed doors and nobody knew, but everybody who ever dined with them, whoever was ever with them, noted how mean she was to him. And it got worse and worse as the years went by. She despised her life with him. And by the end of this chapter, we'll, we're going to get a little bit of a picture of that. But I just can't understand why he was with her. I don't understand why he tethered himself to her so. He does seem like rather a mother's boy because he's all the day long asking his mother, you know, why, why won't you see my wife? You know, it's, he's like really bothered by the fact that he can't get his mother's blessing on his life. He can't just like grow up and be a man and be like, well, these are the choices I've made. And if my mom doesn't like it, I guess that's that. You know, he's just such a wounded spirit about this. And it seems like maybe the reason that he so clung to Wallace was she was such a motherly figure for him. And he desperately seemed to need one. Well, at the same time, Princess Elizabeth had announced her engagement to Philip Mountbatten. And there was no invitation to the November wedding for the Windsors. Even though they were very close relations, they were the only close relations who were not amongst the 2,200 guests. Again, as I said before, the Duke is constantly hammering on to Queen Mary every time he turns around. I'm always hoping that one day you'll tell me to bring Wallace to see you, as it makes me very sad to think that you and she have never really met, wrote the Duke to Queen Mary. It would indeed be tragic if you, my mother, had never known the girl I married and who has made me so blissfully happy. Blissfully happy? What a case of self-delusion. I mean, if that is blissful happiness, Lord may never know it. Okay, so they go to England, you know, they're sniffing around for an invite to this wedding. They don't get it. He's over there writing to his mother, I just wish you'd meet the woman I married, the girl I married, the girl I married. The girl you married, that old hag. Anyway, it's obviously not happening for them, so they double back to America. They go back to the Waldorf Towers where they had become friends with the composer Cole Porter, who also had an apartment there, and they had a Christmas Eve party. It was a large party. There was 20 guests. And one journalist wrote, I was astonished on entering their suite, which they kept permanently, by its almost regal magnificence. There were full-length paintings of George III and George IV in their coronation robes. Others of the Duke's ancestors were there, some in garter regalia, all illuminated in the long salon. Two footmen wore liveries. It was a full-dress affair, the ladies' decollete with jewels. The Duchess wore a small tiara on her black, tightly drawn back hair. A sarice gown molded her svelte figure. The dining room shone with silver, cut glass, flowers. The serviettes were embroidered with the royal arms. This did not look like exile. Well, you know, uh, during this evening of pretend king and queen visiting, um, the Duke serenaded everybody till 3 a.m. to many a song. Apparently he knew an abundance of them. And it's just, it's wild to me that you'd have people over to your house and then spend the majority of the evening making them listen to you sing, even if you do have a good voice. It's like, isn't there something we'd all rather do? So the globe trotting continues. They end up in uh, Florida in 1948 in February. They go on a several weeks cruise into the Caribbean. They go and hang out with Ernest Hemingway. And then they make their way to Long Island in April and May. And they're staying at Severn, the Locust Valley estate of another friend named Polly Howe. But they made themselves an abomination there too, because all the local hostesses were somewhat put off when they were asked to submit their guest list to the Duchess before she would agree to attend any parties. And they were even more put off when their lists were returned with certain names crossed off. Who does she think she is? Yes, I'm not going to come to any parties unless I see the guest list because, of course, I can't come to just any little affair you have. So if you'll submit your guest list to me, I can make some some choices about what I'll be doing. Oh, no, you've invited them. Mm, No, well, I'm going to cross them off. If you have any hope of me coming to the party, you'll take them off. The audacity. I mean, the unmitigated gall. I can't even believe that she thinks that this is appropriate behavior. How distasteful. How could you go into the world like this? Then, they were the guests of honor at the reopening of Robert Young's Greenbrier Hotel in West Virginia. It was a four-day extravaganza paid for by Young for 300 leaders of business, government, society, the motion picture world, and sports. Included in this guest list were Fred and Adele Astaire, Sam Goldwyn, Herbert Hoover, Bob Hope, President Truman, Bing Crosby, William Randolph Hearst, and the Duke, who played the drums for How Are Things and Glockamora during the intermission. 
Why were they invited to this? They don't have a business. They're not part of government. I guess they're part of society. Maybe that's why. But they're not part of motion picture world or sports. And all these other people are some real names. But who wants the Duke and Duchess there? Now, the problem is, is that they've, they've got to find somewhere to lay their heads. This wandering business is getting ridiculous. And you'll recall that they had homes in France. They had an apartment in Paris. And of course, they've been uh, renting LaCroix, that huge estate, for a long time now. That was their summer home. But they're a little bit concerned about what's going on in the French government. Concerned by radical leftist governments in France, the Windsors now thought of moving to Switzerland or Ireland. They even bought a plot in southern Spain to build a house. They took a nine-month trip to America in June of 1948, planning to settle in the United States, but eventually they were drawn back to France, partly because they could not find the right house, but largely because of the attractive tax break they were given by the French. Now, like I said, they had that big, sprawling summer estate, La Croix, uh, but that ended in the spring of 1949, and they were not able to find something sufficient. So now they only had their home in Paris. They'd given up the Ritz apartment, and they had taken a four-year lease at this apartment, which they hated. And you just have to ask yourself, well, then why did you rent it for four years? I mean, they despised the place. The book describes it th thus. Thick hedges and tall wrought iron gates protected the Hotel Particulier from the street. The outer hall led to a large entrance hall where portraits of the Duke at various ages lined walls and an elegant marble staircase led to a small landing where a marble horse stood looking down the stairs. The Duchess did not like it and it was hidden behind a screen. The stairs continued to the drawing room, dining room, library, sitting room, and the Duchess's study. Above were the bedroom. One bathroom decorated by Elsie de Wolfe had leopard skin walls, and the house was furnished with Marcel Proust's desk and eight chairs, which had belonged to Marie Antoinette. Neither Windsor ever liked the house. It was too cramped for entertaining. The dining room sat only 24. <laughs> what a tiny little cramped abode we have. The dining room only seats 24? What sort of parties can we have? And the rooms were cold and dark, and the Duke objected to a huge organ in the foyer disguised as a bookcase. So sometimes they, so sometimes they used the Ritz whenever they were in Paris. They continue to just drive everyone crazy. Everywhere they go, people can't wait to scuttle back home and write in their diaries about what the experience is like. Lady Diana Cooper, who was always one for a oh, sharp word, said, My lost rank has its advantages. I don't have to sit next to the Duke, remembered Lady Diana Cooper, now no longer ambassadress of one such dinner in November 1948. The thing is, is that all David and Wallace had to do was to socialize. It was their only engagement, and they took it so seriously. I think working for Wallace Simpson would have felt like a stint in hell. The book says that socializing was the only occupation the Windsors had, giving structure to a life without purpose and serving to keep them both stimulated. It was something Wallace took extremely seriously with a close attention to detail. At the dinner, she kept a golden notepad at her side. The servants called it her grumble book. To note the successes and mistakes. She was a perfectionist. Even the leaves of lamb's lettuce served at meals had to be the same size. And rather than serve one sort of bread, she would serve a choice of six. Each individual would have their own butter pot with a porcelain-handled knife. And one regular guest, the designer Jacqueline de Ribs, remembered that there was so much cutlery you never knew what to pick up. The table had so much upon it that I got bewildered, wrote Diana Cooper, of a dinner for Henry Lucci, the publisher of Life and Time. And we'll go on to talk about how that table looked. But I just have to stop. I have to make a comment. How tacky to keep a book right beside you during the meal to talk about all of your personal successes and failures or the perceived successes and failures of the evening so that you can trot back to tell your servants about what happened. It just seems like you're exposing the mechanisms of the performance you're trying to put on that you would in real time note for all your guests to see what you think you did well and what you think you failed to do. Shouldn't you just make a mental note of that if you must? Because... Everything that Wallace did is a performance. It's, it isn't to be looked at as somebody who opened their home and invited some people over for a bowl of chili after church. This is like her trying to put on a production so that everybody will think that she's really enviable in her ability to pull this off. But to sit there with a notebook seems like you're ruining your very image in the moment. 
For her to call attention to how meticulous she must be in order to provide this level of entertainment sort of ruins the magic of it, it seems to me. But anyway, um, to continue on, Diana Cooper had much to say about how cluttered the table was. And what I think is interesting is all these people who are being asked to their house for these dinners aren't people off the street who wouldn't know which fork to use in a normal circumstance. But it's like, Wallace has to go above and beyond anything anybody's ever experienced to such a point where her guests feel uncomfortable because there's so much on the table they don't know how to use. It isn't as though these people had never been invited to a dinner in which there was quite a lot of cutlery on the table. Now, lay people, people like me, might be you know, confounded at the presence of more than one of each piece of cutlery, but these people would not have been. So you can imagine there must have been an enormous amount of cutlery on the table if their guests, the, the elite who are being asked to their table, if even those people are confused. So Diana Cooper says that the table was overflowing to clutter. There were these Nymphenburg cornucopias from which came these little slave figurines. There was monkeys. There's fruit falling out of them. Then on top of that hideous centerpiece, there were flowers. There were candles. There were boxes for toothpicks and cruets, of course, and matches individual and cigarettes and gold boxes and five equal sized knives, ditto forks in white Dresden china. I had to ask which to take for what and further blotted my copybook by using my side plate as an ashtray instead of a gold dish. Okay, here I will expose my utter ignorance, but what is a gold dish? What is that? They had all sorts of rituals, which I am just sort of aghast that she thought were superior to the regular ways of things. Now, if you were asked to dinner at their house, you were asked to be there by 8.45. Dinner would be served at 9.15 sharp. There was never soup because Wallace claimed, after all those cocktails, soup is just another drink. What does that mean? No, it isn't. It's savory and delicious. I'd way rather skip a cocktail and have a bowl of soup. But anyway, she can do what she wants in the soup department. Then This next thing is a travesty. Rather than serve cheese, she preferred camembert ice cream. Camembert mixed with cream, then coated in breadcrumbs and then frozen, which was served with port. What the hell made up kind of a dish is this? Why are you taking the cheese, mixing it up with cream, rolling it in breadcrumbs and freezing that mess, and then serving that with port? Yuck. I mean, why are we taking away the real cheese for this foolishness? Not the cheese, anything but that. Okay, well, they would never have been able to pull off these shindigs if it hadn't been for the staff. 18 people they employed. 18. And you guys, we're going to talk about how much it cost them to keep these servants. It will blow your mind, the figure. Okay, but to give a rundown of who's putting on this show. The couple employed several well-known chefs, including Lucien Massey and Rene Legros, who were said to be one of the four greatest chefs in the world. Beneath the chef was an assistant, two kitchen boys, and a pastry cook. There was then the butler, Ernest Wilmot, assisted by Sidney Johnson, the faithful bohemian, and several footmen. Under the housekeeper were four housemaids, two just to take care of Wallace's clothes, run her bath, and you guys, this is going to blow your mind. She had people to iron her sheets twice a day. Are you taking that many naps? And what are you doing in the bed? Are you rolling around frothing at the mouth? Why do your sheets have to be ironed twice a day? If you had your sheets ironed daily, I would find that shocking. But twice a day? The Duke had a valet simply called Campbell. The two chauffeurs, Ronald Marchant and David Boyer, were in charge of the four cars, a Humber sedan, Buick sedan, and a Buick estate car, and a royal blue Cadillac limousine with the royal crest on it, built to the Duke's specifications and a gift from James Mooney. Why does he have the royal crest on it? Wallace's secretary, Denise Hive, a former Air France stewardess, and the Duke's secretary, Victor Wadelove, a former stock jobber's clerk, brought the total to 18. Friends, how much do you think it costs to pay all these people in your employment? Oh, just $125,000, but how much is that in real money, in today's money? Sit back, friends. $4.6 million. Can you even imagine having that kind of income? Now, how could they manage this? $4.6 million? This wandering exile king has this kind of throwaway income where he can employ 18 people 
none of whom they actually needed. Well, first the Duke, with his diplomatic status, bought his drink, tobacco, and many of his household goods and petrol through the British Embassy and the military commissary duty-free. Likewise, their television said many electrical goods and cars were not taxed. Even so, is that going to save you $4.6 million just because you got a couple of groceries at the commissary? Hard to imagine. The Windsors paid some 20% below the going rate for wages, on the ground that it was an honor to work for them, and the position invariably led to more lucrative job offers elsewhere. That is so horrifically low class. Can you even... 20% below the going rate because it's a privilege. You should be thanking your lucky stars. Get down on your knees and lick these boots. I mean, can you even? At Christmas, however, staff were given, as required by French law, you French, (laughs) love it, an extra month's pay and either a wallet or cufflink with the royal cipher for men and a cashmere sweater or some nylon stockings for the women. An inducement to stay were the promises that servants would be taken care of in the couple's will. I think the thing that's crazy is, you know, they keep wanting all the servants to stay and they're like, yeah, if you'll stay, we'll remember you in our will. But then how are these servants supposed to make good on that whole 20% decrease in wages, but will be a good reference for you later? How, how is that excuse supposed to still work? If I'm supposed to work for these people until they die, then how am I supposed to feel better about the fact that I'm getting paid 20% less than all of my other servant friends? Well, we're paying you 20% less. But of course, we'll be a great reference for you later if you decide to go somewhere else. But then also, you better stay on with us because we're going to remember you in our will. Meanwhile, they're not going to increase your pay if you stay on. So ridiculous. Even so, even for all the bargaining of Wallace and David, you know, transparent though it was, the writer Charles Murphy noted the turnover was high, though resignations, far less dismissal, received only the most meager severance pay. Marchant, who you'll recall was one of the chauffeurs, was forced to resign after over 20 years service because of ill health. He received no pension and he was paid off with a few thousand francs. What happened to remembering people in their will? I don't, I don't understand. How can somebody work faithfully for 20 years and then you don't give them any pay and they stayed on with you because of the promises you had made? Likewise, the other chauffeur, Boyer, stayed for 27 years only to be sacked with less than a week's notice. It's disgraceful. How can you treat your staff like this? 27 years and 20 years these these guys worked? The book goes on to say that people who saw the way the Duchess treated her servants sort of have a real raised eyebrow for it. I mean, it was pretty shocking. I knew many of her staff remembered Letitia Ballridge, who worked later as Jacqueline Kennedy's social secretary, and she did not treat them particularly well. The Honorable Sarah Morrison, the stepdaughter of the Earl of Dudley, then a teenager living in Paris, had dined with the Windsors once a week for two years and related how rude Wallace was to staff, giving the impression that she thought someone was going to take advantage of her and how she was pretty nasty to the Duke, domineering and bossy. Working conditions were not easy with long hours and very precise demands. Charles Murphy remembered tongue lashings, harsh and overt, were routine. Holidays were ignored, as was overtime. Nothing earned praise or seemed to give satisfaction. I mean... What would be the point of working for these people? I mean, truly, I think I can only imagine trying to work there for a little while as, you know, a potential reference. But like the fact that some of these people gave 27 years in service, I can't even believe it. You know, what what grim world did they have to return to that working for the Duke and the Duchess was some sort of improvement on what they thought the rest of the world could offer them? A woman who worked for the Windsors for 10 years recalled, it was impossible for either of them to express gratitude. Their servants were made to feel that they were anything but indispensable. The Duke and Duchess were doing them an honor by having them around. But could we expect anything more from people who hand out autographed hotel postcards as some kind of a tip? Remember when they did that? When they stayed at the hotel in New York and then Wallace calls them all in like she's really going to do them all a favor and starts handing out hotel postcards, not even pictures of, of themselves, but hotel postcards that she and the Duke had bothered the, their pretty little heads to sign and then handed around like, here you go. Here you go. You're welcome. I mean, I'd rather take a slap in the face. Well... One Christmas, the Duke's private secretary, John Utter, gave his employer a small bag for carrying his golf shoes out to the course. And the Duke shifted nervously from foot to foot. Well, I'm sorry, John, but until the mill has been sold, I'm afraid we can't afford a present for you. 
You guys, are you not just so embarrassed by that? How in the world could he possibly say that to one of his servants? His poor little servant gives him a bag for his golf shoes. It's like such a sweet gesture, you know? Like, why in the world did he feel like he needed to give the Duke something? But all right, he's showing great manners. Gives the Duke a gift on Christmas. And the Duke's like, oh, well, I don't have anything for you. We can't afford it. How are we going to buy bread and milk? I can't afford to give my servants presents. My goodness, we're just rubbing two pennies together to maintain this establishment. Did you think I was going to get you a present? (laughs) Oh, no, dear chap, no, not that. But just when you're like so sickened you can barely turn another page, another paradox is displayed. And I just could not make heads or tails of this. I sat and reread this passage numerous times trying to figure out how did this make psychological sense. The book goes on to say that according to one staff member, every Christmas a party was held for staff in the royal couple. And they took delight in the children, who, although warned by their parents to be on their best behavior, inevitably wound up racing through the rooms. At one party, a little boy was playing with some tin soldiers, and he accidentally knocked over the vase, which was serving as his castle. It broke, of course, and he burst into tears. But the Duchess took his hand, helped him to clean up the pieces, and then spent the rest of the afternoon playing soldiers with him on the grand staircase. I cannot reconcile these two things. I cannot reconcile the stinginess with which they cared for their adult staff and then would open their homes and have these little have these Christmas parties where the staff would bring their families and then their things would get broken and they'd be like, oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's go play Tin Soldiers on the Stairs. Like, what a delightful image of her. And yet, how does she contain these two characters? What is this split in personality? I feel like she did have a softness in her heart for children. We saw that during the war. And we saw the way she treated the children in the Bahamas during the war. And the war efforts that she engaged in did often have to do with children. I think there's this odd strain in her heart towards maternity. And I think maybe that's why she babied the Duke so. I don't know. But whenever children are involved, she shows a beautiful side to her character. I think it was a real tragedy she didn't have kids. She probably would have been a great mother. Or if not great, at least it would have lent her an opportunity to show her better side more often. But unfortunately, all we continue to get for the rest of the chapter are stories after stories after stories of her showing her lesser side. And this next story is a great example of how self-centered she was. The Duchess kept up on all the arrivals of celebrities in Paris with a subscription to celebrity service. When a prominent American author was in Paris, the Duchess would not only send an invitation, but buy one of his or her books. She would then, Cleve and Amory remembered, pick out a particularly good line, and then during the dinner, when there was a total silence, she would turn to the author and say, I really think that your line, and then she would slowly quote the exact line, is so wonderfully put. And after she had done this, at least one guest would always say to a companion, isn't that just like the Duchess? She keeps up on everything. But it's all a production called The Hostess with the Mostess, and she wants you to notice how wonderful she is at it. It wasn't so that her guests could feel seen. It was that she could be seen and so that people could continue to compliment her. It has nothing to do with being a good hostess. Being a good hostess means that you bring people into your home and make it about them and you celebrate the fact that they are there and you, you're you interested in what they have to say and you're interested in bringing them into the fold and making it a very homey and wonderful and cozy experience for everybody involved. <clears throat> <clears throat> but the Dutch just wants you to come in and watch your show and then to applaud her. The book goes on to reinforce that. It says everything was focused on making themselves and their house look good. The Duchess had Edward from Alexandra's come to the house daily and comb her hair, which considering how ugly her hairstyle was, if I can be blunt, I can't imagine she needed to employ somebody to make it look like that. Didn't she just need to spray her head with water, slick everything down with gel to the most extreme angle, and then call it a day? I mean, I can't imagine what Edward was doing that she couldn't have done herself with a stiff brush. There were then her regular hair and makeup treatments at Elizabeth Arden Salon, where she was treated like royalty. A bouquet of her favorite flowers was placed in a special cut glass vase in her private treatment room. On call were her favorite coiffeurs, Claude, Roger, and Manuel, who would apply the specially formulated secret dye which she always carried with her wherever she traveled, and Madeline, the makeup expert, with a specially created foundation designed to accentuate her eyes and draw attention away from her prominent jawline. Look, I'm not opposed to somebody going and like, 
you know, go to the salon if you want to. I mean, sure. But what her behavior at the salon, I think is the thing that really shocks me. Also, her your special hair dye that you carry with you, your specially secret formulated hair dye, wasn't her hair just dyed black? I mean, it didn't look like anything that was a, a big secret. I think anybody can apply some black hair dye and look about the same as she did. But it was her behavior, I think, that really I find to be offensive. She could be a demanding customer, complaining once when she felt that she had not been properly received and escorted. The sales girl was immediately sacked, who she complained about. For all the special treatment that she received at Arden's, Wallace was not known as a good tipper, wrote one of her biographers. Indeed, she was a non-tipper. Instead, if they were lucky, the women would receive gold and diamond pins in the shape of the Prince of Wales' feathers, and for the men, gold cufflinks stamped with the royal crest. The historical significance of these gifts was often lost on their recipients, who would have much preferred a check or cash. Now, okay. As to that last bit, what's wrong with getting a gold and diamond pin? I'm not going to spurn that gift because that truly I feel like is of some value and some worth you know it's it's a lot better than if she had just turned around and given them a postcard of Paris signed with her name you know what is what are you going to do with that but you could probably get some cash for that gold and diamond pin but what really surprises me is just the fact that she could go into a place and just not tip people um who are clearly doing her a service you know, and it that's not like a, oh, I don't know if I should tip this person. When you go and get your hair done, that's part of it. You you should expect to give quite a generous tip. And I just don't understand how she could go through life acting like, you know, it was just lucky for you that you got to be with me. So the very fact that I'm giving you anything is really much more than I should have to do. And complaining about people to the point where they get fired. I mean, just tacky, tacky behavior. At this time, the Duke, who clearly had nothing to do, I mean, he can't find employment, he's not welcome in England, he's got nothing to do anywhere in the world, he's wandering aimlessly from place to place, decides that it might be time for him to write his memoirs. And the thing is, is that he'd gotten the idea because in February of 1947, he'd been offered by uh, Henry Lucci, the proprietor of Time Life, to write four articles under the title The Education of a Prince, covering his career up th to the First World War, and it was ghosted by a Time Life journalist, Charles Murphy. So these articles appeared in Life in December, and then they were syndicated around the world with a further four running in May of 1950. Tommy Lassels was incensed by them because he said that the Duke did not need to be talking about his tie to the royal family in any way or exposing anything that he had done before as the former prince. He just felt like it, it was yet one more time when David was willing to use his family as a way for him to get some notice and attention, and Tommy thought that it was pretty tasteless. However, encouraged by the public reception and the earnings from the articles, and keen to set down his own version of events and fill his time and make some more money, in July of 1948, the Duke agreed to work with Murphy on an autobiography codenamed Operation Belvedere. The target delivery date was September of 1949, but the book was to be bedeviled by delays, never particularly self-disciplined. The Duke preferred to spend his time socializing, and new sensitivities also cast a gloom over the book. For example, Churchill was nervous that his support of the Duke during the abdication would affect his relationship with the royal family, and he asked that his private correspondence not be used and publication be delayed until after the general election. Further problems were that the Duke would always show up completely unprepared and unready to even work on the on the book. Murphy was later to write of the Duke that, quote, his span of attention was two and a half minutes maximum. And when the story of the preceding night was plainly written in his trembling hands and bloodshot eyes, I knew that another work day would have to be scrubbed. <laughs> oh, man, I just that's. Uh, when the story of the preceding night was plainly written in his trembling hands and bloodshot eyes, I knew another work day would have to be scrubbed. I laughed out loud when I read that. I mean, can you imagine being tasked to work with this person? Probably this ghostwriter felt the same as when Prince Harry sat down and said he was going to write his memoirs. I imagine it was a very similar experience. It was not helped by Wallace's lack of support for the enterprise, giving precedence to the couple's social life over the looming delivery deadline. It was almost as if she resented the Duke doing something for himself and did not want to revisit the past. Now, something else that was looming over their life at the time was the fact that the king was in very ill health. 
Now, you know they're wandering around with nothing to do but socialize. Going from country to country, falling on the uh, friendship of the uppity ups, um, being hosted at their homes for months on end, putting on parties of their own in, you know, the Waldorf or the Ritz. I mean, they're living st- uh, this strange, wandering, rich life. Um, but they've cast their eyes over to England because they know that the king is very, very ill. And it may be that he can no longer reign and that he may need a regent. When they had been talking with their friend, Kenneth de Courcy, remember, he's that editor, that American editor who's been whispering in their ear that what he thinks they should do is just, you know, buy an estate there and then sort of slowly but surely wiggle and worm their way back in. He has been whispering in their ear, and the whole reason he came up with that plan for them was because the king is sick, and he thinks this is the perfect time to show up and be the answer to everybody's problems. In the spring of 1949, George VI lay in bed in Buckingham Palace following an operation to cut a nerve at the base of his spine. It was designed to counteract the arteriosclerosis from which the king now suffered as a result of too much stress and too many cigarettes, and there was a danger that both his legs might have to be amputated. The king's incapacity provided an opportunity for his older brother. The king is gravely ill and out of circulation, and he will not be in circulation again wrote Kenneth de Corsi to the Duke. We better jump in. You better make your play now because I think the Mountbatten's are trying to, you know, hem in and we need to make sure that we don't let them make more of this opportunity than they can. You know, this is your spot, David. You you jump in and you be the answer to your brother's problems now. Step in. And we don't need to let the Mountbatten's hedge in here and get more authority than is due them. The Windsor's ambition to settle, even temporarily in Britain since the war, had all been predicated on knowledge of George VI's poor health and the wish to be available should the call come for the Duke to act as a caretaker regent. Such was their suspicions that Prince Philip's uncle, Lord Mountbatten, would seek to influence the young Queen Elizabeth II, that the Windsors and de Courcy took the idea of a soft coup d'etat seriously. In the event, there was no regency and any opportunity for the Duke to help shape plans passed. Well, perhaps it was this disappointment that sent Wallace reeling, and her tacky behavior sinks to levels previously unknown. Now, up to this point, we've had lots of reports of people saying that she's very cold, that she's, you know, has kind of a vindictive nature. She's certainly not looking to forgive grievances quickly. Um, And because her life has become such a meaningless and pointless thing, and because she blames the Duke for it, it has made her pine all the more after a former flame. Who might that be? Herman Rogers. Now you will recall from the beginning of the book that Herman Rogers was a person that she had known way back when in China. And he had been married to a woman named Catherine and they had often lived with Wallace when she was waiting around for the Duke to come and marry her right after the abdication. And it had been very odd because Rogers had stayed in a bedroom right next to Wallace. Their bedrooms adjoined. Meanwhile, Catherine slept in a completely different wing of the house. So it was always a very weird, their relationship. He had kind of like this sort of protective nature over Wallace. But it would seem that she had eyes for him, though he did not return all of that affection. I think maybe he maybe felt a protective sense over her because she was an old friend. And of course, they were like living in her house, in her in, in her castle, um, that was back when she was living in um, Chateau de Candy. So I think that maybe he was looking to help her feel protected because she was putting a roof over their heads. I'm not totally sure what his feelings were, although it seems pretty evident through this next series of stories that he was definitely not on the same page she was. But anyway, Catherine has died at this point in the story, and so he's taking a new wife. Wallace is beside herself with jealousy. In August of 1950, the Windsors were invited to the second wedding of Herman Rogers. Catherine had died in May of 1949. His new bride was a widow, Lucy Wan, who had been part of his social circle. What he had not realized was that Wallace, long in love with Herman herself, still had designs on him. There's no question that these women were rivals in love, remembered Lucy's daughter-in-law, Kitty Blair. Both wanted Herman. Wallace would have grabbed him and told the Duke to go. Wallace made her feelings clear, telling Lucy Wan, I hold you responsible if anything happens to Herman. He's the only man I've ever loved. How nice for the Duke, Lucy icily replied. 
Her boredom in her own marriage had been acute, and she was no longer as discreet as before when it came to hiding her feelings, according to one friend of the Windsors. Having failed to dissuade Herman from marrying Lucy, Wallace sought her revenge in other ways. The wedding present, an antique silver salver, bore the inscription to Herman Livingston Rogers on the occasion of his marriage, August 9th, 1950, from Edward and Wallace. No mention of Lucy, and the date was wrong. Oh, what a stab in the heart, Wallace. You really got him back. You know, you inscribed that silver salver with the wrong wedding date, not even one mention of his new wife. Good for you. You get him, girl. Like, how could she honestly feel like that was a real, like, a real blow? You know, now he'll really know how you feel, Wallace. It's like, how stupid. How stupid. But it gets so much worse, and it's so petty. It's unbelievable. So on the morning of the wedding, which, by the way, the date had been picked out to suit the Windsors. Okay, so they're coming to this wedding on a day that they had picked out so that they could make it, which makes it even worse that she didn't get the date right on the silver salver. But anyway, on the morning of the wedding, just as Lucy was setting off to the Marie for the civil ceremony, Wallace had begun to tug at the collar of Lucy's wedding dress. We can't have you looking like this today. She pulled and twisted the satin until it was completely shapeless. There, she said, that's better. How cruel! Do you like it? Do you think it will do? Oh, why, you little thing! Get that hair! Oh, no! Oh, and look, that's my sash wearing my sash! She can't! You oh, 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 please! Oh, 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 that is the vibe we're getting from Wallace here. Why are you being like this? He's chosen Lucy. He didn't choose you. So why are you trying to wreck her dress and make her look sloppy and awful on her wedding day? Like, I, if I were Lucy, could you imagine? Like, how could you even stand to see this person? Other than maybe she was just gloating that she had gotten Roger and Wallace hadn't. So she didn't mind Wallace being present for this victory of hers. I don't know. Now, on to the reception. It just, it's so humiliating that they thought they could act this way. It's so insane. The reception was to be held between 6 and 8 p.m., with the Windsors regarded as an equal attraction to the newly married couple. Yet they did not bother to arrive between 6 and 8 when the reception was to be held. Finally, when they had not bothered to arrive at 8.15, guests began to leave because I guess Wallace and David are not coming. At 8 45, a full 45 minutes after the end of the event, the Windsors appeared, claiming that they had been with their architect. I'm sorry we couldn't make it. We were with our architect. Sorry, it just took a really long time. Uh, but Wallace, your architect was at our reception, said Lucy sweetly. I mean, first of all, how do you schedule a meeting with your architect the day of the wedding that for these friends who have designed the date of their wedding to suit your social calendar. And then be like, I'm um, sorry, we just weren't able to make it. That meeting with that architect just went real long. Well, you shouldn't have even had a meeting with the architect, but also the architect is here. I mean, what? What behavior is this? People just could not figure out what was going on with them. Afterwards at dinner, Wallace monopolized Herman, suggesting they talk Chinese together. Because, of course, you know, they both were from China and they both spent time in China. And let's, you know, rekindle our old days, you, you and I, back way back when we go, we go back so far. Well, Herman still flown himself, but knowing that she only spoke three words and not wishing to be drawn into her games, pretended that he had forgotten the language. Her parting shot was to bustle the Duke into their car and drive off, leaving the bride and groom to find their own way home. How could she act like this? This is so embarrassing. Just the mental picture of her going and being like, let's speak Chinese together. But she doesn't know any Chinese. And it's just a ploy to like help him remember that, you know, she and he go way back. Some real embarrassing behavior. The Duke and Duchess and their relationship continue to intrigue those that met them. Diana Cooper, always good for a word, dining with them in October 1950, later wrote, Wallace is dreadfully overanimated and I don't somehow think it's drink. Benzedrine, rather. She repeats herself embarrassingly. I talked to the Duke after dinner, a particular agony, about the Bahamas. He said, it was a bit difficult for me. You see, I'd been King Emperor, and there I was, a third-rate governor. 
He said things like that so simply. No boggle, no laugh, no inverted commas. When they're together, they're like two automata. They have no intimacy. They seldom talk of anything at all serious. They drift, noted Cecil Beaton in his diary. And he goes on to say, Meanwhile, the prince is happy in his relationship with her. He depends on her utterly. It's a mother-mistress relationship. She looks after him like a child and yet makes entertainment for him as she did in the days when he was the prince, coming to her home for relaxation at the end of a long day. She now gives him the antidote to hard work, but he's done none of the hard work. He's done nothing. She's nearly driven mad trying to find ways of amusing him. He has no interests. He thought he was bored at being a royalty, and he has no reason since to consider that he has stopped being bored. He has no intellect. He never opens a book. And in many ways, his memory has gone. Steam, baths, and brandy have made him very weak. The years as prince have gone by in a flash. He has a trained driver's memory of places he's visited, but remembers nothing of what happened in any of them. The years of the wandering Windsors had begun. Oh, what a legacy to leave behind. Can you even begin to conceive of how strange these people are? That last story about the way Wallace acted at that wedding... That's what her life is becoming. It's just becoming this sad, catty event in which she's got to constantly make up for what she doesn't have. And I think that that's probably the beginning of a lot of episodes we're going to read about her. To disfigure the dress of the bride, to try to scoop her husband away and have private and intimate recollections of past times, to show up late to reception and then make such a clearly bogus excuse to tell the bride I'm in love with your husband. These aren't the actions of a classy woman. I get really tired of people telling me, well, Wallace came from money in her own right. She was not just a nobody. She was actually, you know, the heiress to quite a load of money in America if she'd married the right person, but she was unwilling to do it. And so, you know, she wasn't exactly a nobody. She's not Meghan Markle. Well, maybe she didn't lead the life of Oliver Twist, and maybe she isn't over there just trying to scrap for a living, and maybe she did come from money. Her behavior is so poor and so low class, it's sometimes hard to remember she had any kind of elite upbringing at all. Constantly trying to put forward this idea that she is so profoundly knowledgeable about all things culture, all things elite. She comes off as somebody trying so hard that the desperation makes her feel like it's not natural to her. I'm really looking forward, though, to next chapter. The next chapter is called Secret Affairs. What could that be about? And it's quite a long chapter. So I think that it's going to be a really good one. But tell me what you thought of this chapter. Was it as juicy as I said it was? Because I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the way they treated their staff. I couldn't believe the way she acted at that wedding. I could not believe the way they just, once again, fall on the charity of all of their many, many relatives. I couldn't believe the way they were waiting in the wings for the king to finally tump over so that David could leap forward and be like, I'll, I'll stand in for him. It's like, don't worry, he's got an heir and she's completely able and ready to do this job. Anyway, um, so good. I will see you guys later. Um, I'll probably, honestly, I kind of want to keep, I want to do more than just one chapter of this a week because I would like to finish this book. The next uh, royal book that we read, I really would like to do one about Princess Diana. I'm ready to tackle that now. When I first started the channel, I was not ready to tackle that subject. I have hot takes on Princess Diana. I don't think that they're going to be super popular. And so I was like, I don't know if I'm ready to tread in those waters. Well, I am now. I found my voice and I don't have have any problem calling people out. Um, so I really want to do a Princess Diana book. Even though I feel a little bit reluctant about Lady C as far as I think sometimes her delivery can be a little bit um, gossipy, I, I have heard over and over and over and over again that the book is well researched and well written. So I would like to read that. Anyway, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys soon. We'll have more Britney episodes as we look to close out that book. And then I think we've got two more parts on that book. And then We'll be finishing this one. Um, and Matthew Perry, again, is going to be our pop culture book. And then Princess Diana will be our royal book after that. So that's what I'm looking towards. Um, again, you guys are great at leaving suggestions. So if you have any books that you really want me to read over the course of this next year, let me know and I will consider them. I will absolutely consider them. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.